Dead America, Carolina Front, Part 7. Dead America, The Third Week, Book 11. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 21. Terrell sat by the window of a small, rundown motel, peering out into the darkness. It had only been a few hours since they'd been forced to leave Clinton by the boss, He couldn't dwell on it too much, however, since it wasn't the first time in his career that he had been forced out of a bad situation. As he stared outside at the dimly lit, moonlit street of the tiny town, he allowed his mind to wander, and naturally it turned back to Walter. Losing the kid due to his own stupidity, he reached for the gun, checking to make sure it was loaded. That was a mistake he would never make again. As Terrell put down the weapon, He noticed movement outside, a couple of shambling figures about 20 yards away. No matter where we go, these things are always there, he thought bitterly, and got up from his seat. He headed to the door and unlatched the deadbolt. The click roused Coleman, who had been crashed out on the king-sized bed next to Miles, who continued to snore loudly. Everything okay, Cap? Coleman asked, voice still thick with sleep. Terrell nodded. Yeah, just a couple of strays. Need some help? His friend asked, rubbing his eyes. The captain shook his head. Nah, I'm good, he said. You get some rest. Terrell gently opened and shut the door behind him, walking out towards the parking lot. His light footsteps were enough to excite the ghouls working their way towards him. They moaned, opening their mouths with hunger, stretching their arms towards their fresh meal. Terrell casually approached the first one, a young, pallid figure in tattered, bloody jeans and a T-shirt, kicking it squarely in the chest and knocking it to the ground. He pulled his knife from its sheath and slammed it down into the skull of the other one, a heavyset blonde that looked like it had been in its fifties when it died. He watched emotionlessly as what had once been a woman collapsed to the ground in a heap. He was just numb to it all. After a few seconds of staring, he heard the other creature starting to get up. Moving without a sense of urgency, Terrell pulled the knife from the first creature and slammed it through the eye socket of the second. He glanced around the dimly lit parking lot, searching for any other movement. When he was confident there was none, he pulled his knife, wiped it on the now still corpse, and headed back inside. As he quietly closed the door behind him, Coleman took a sip from a lukewarm bottle of water, sitting in the chair Terrell had previously occupied while they slept. Looking pretty casual out there, Cap, Coleman said softly. Terrell shrugged. They were pretty dinged up, so not much of a threat. Still, his friend dragged out the word. It's not like you to take your time with them. The captain nodded thoughtfully, but didn't respond, heading to the window and taking a seat opposite him. You still got another 45 minutes. Why don't you get some rest, he asked. Nah, I'm good, Coleman replied, shaking his head. Not really sleeping anyway. As if on cue, Miles let out a loud snort and rolled over in his sleep, pulling the covers into a cocoon around his body. Terrell raised an eyebrow. Doesn't seem to be a problem for him, he said. Some people are special, Coleman replied. They stared out the window for a time, side by side, the silence stretching out, and not into comfortable companionship. So, Coleman finally said, picking at a loose thread in his pants. You want to talk about it? Terrell shook his head immediately. Not really, he replied. Would rather focus on what's ahead of us. So what is ahead of us, Cap? Coleman asked. The captain chuckled darkly. Hell if I know, buddy. Well, we know for sure heading north is out, Coleman said with a sigh. At least until we get an army big enough to wipe the smile off of that smug asshole's face, Terrell added, clenching a fist. Coleman shrugged. Well, let's start finding us one then, he suggested. Surprisingly upbeat of you, Terrell replied, not meeting his gaze. His companion leaned back in his chair. Yeah, I know, he admitted but didn't see any coffee, so I gotta do something to wake up. How about a short walk, Terrell asked, getting to his feet. Coleman cocked his head. 
where are we going? Hotel office, the captain replied, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. They might have a map with all of the tourist trap brochures. Coleman motioned to Miles, still sound asleep in his burrito. What about him? Eh, he'll be fine, Terrell replied, waving a hand at the bed. He led them out of the room, closing the door quietly behind them, and then headed up the sidewalk towards the office. They kept a watch on their surroundings for movement, but didn't see anything. Six doors down, the front office was busted in, with dried bloodstains around the frame. Terrell shook his head at the sight, knowing that the manager probably hadn't fared too well from this attack. Just to be safe, he drew his knife before stepping inside, doing a quick sweep to make sure it was secure. The front area had a small coffee station and a rack of tourist trap brochures. He peeked behind the counter, seeing bloodstains on the other side, but no body. He tugged on the door leading to the back office to make sure it was secured. Problems? Coleman asked. Terrell shook his head. If there is, it ain't getting out, he said. His companion reached the rack and scanned the brochures. Water park, outlet mall. Oh, hey, Cap, here we go, gold mining. Hell yeah, Terrell replied with a laugh. Let's go strike it rich, retire to some nice deserted island. Coleman shook his head with a grin. Deserted, he asked. I was kind of hoping for a full service bar, and maybe a bikini clad lady or 12. A man can dream, Terrell replied wistfully. Coleman continued to scan the rack of brochures, finally finding a map of the Carolinas. He set it down on the table where the coffee would normally have been and spread it out. Terrell leaned against the counter and watched as his partner traced his finger along the highway leading south out of Clinton. Okay, best guess is that we are somewhere south of Elizabeth Town, Coleman mused. I don't think this place is big enough to actually have a spot on the map. Terrell nodded. Explains why the place is empty. So it looks like we're about 40 miles or so away from the South Carolina state line, Coleman said, leaning back. To be honest, with where we are and having the North cut off, we don't really have a lot of options. The captain chewed his lip for a moment as he studied the map where his friend was pointing. We're not too far away from Wilmington, which has got to be a total shit show, he murmured. Without a doubt, Coleman nodded. I'm pretty sure some of our boys were casting off from there. Terrell sighed, which means locals and everybody else within a 100 miles were going there to hitch a ride. He shuddered. Safe to say that's out as an option, Coleman said. The captain scanned the map some more. We aren't too far away from the interstate, he said. Could always head up to Charlotte and see what Kyle is up to. Bastard is probably lounging around in the stadium, playing Xbox on the Jumbotron. Coleman said dryly, and they shared a chuckle at the mental image. Only other major cities on the map are Columbia and Charleston, Terrell continued, both of which are major halls. Coleman nodded. One's the capital, and the other is a port town, so not really a fan of either option. So no bright ideas, Terrell asked. His friend looked back over at the rack, prompting an exasperated laugh from the captain. After studying for a moment, he picked out a brochure for the South Carolina Low Country. I mean, we could just head to the Low Country, he suggested. Terrell raised an eyebrow. Low Country, he asked. Coleman scanned the brochure. Says here it's a laid back small town experience that provides cocktails, fishing, and a relaxing lifestyle, he reported. Terrell grabbed the brochure, looking at pictures of men fishing, people on patios drinking, and a crawfish festival. I wouldn't say no to some crawfish, he quipped. I figure if we head that way, we'll be in the sticks, Coleman continued, so resistance will be minimal. Terrell sighed and set the brochure down on the counter. Low country it is then, he declared. Can't be any worse than where we currently are. Or where we've been, Coleman added. The captain took a deep breath. Now the next question is, he began, do we actually have the goods to get us down there? SUV has about a half a tank left, so we'll have to stop, Coleman said. Got plenty of food and water, probably last us a good 10 days or so if we're careful. Terrell cocked his head. And ammo? 
We have about 120 rounds for our assault rifles, Coleman replied, wrinkling his nose. Another 60 for our handguns, and I've got 20 rounds for my sniper rifle. The captain sighed. Well, as long as the trouble is minimal like it is here, then we'll be fine. As the last word came out of his mouth, he caught movement outside from the corner of his eye. When he peered out the window, he saw a figure moving quickly, darting behind bushes across the street. Lean back out of sight, he demanded. Coleman quickly ducked down, leaning back against the wall. What is it, Cap? he asked. Terrell continued to stare out the window, looking for more movement. After several moments, he saw nothing. I think we got company, he murmured. Zombies? Coleman asked. Terrell shook his head. Nope. Shit, his partner replied. My guns are in the truck. There are a couple of assault rifles in the room, Terrell replied. But that didn't help them immediately either. He turned around and headed for the door leading to the back office. He turned the knob as he drew his knife and threw it open. On the ground was a body that looked like it had been chewed up by a horde. It struggled to move, but there wasn't enough of its limbs to do it. He drove the knife down into the back of its head. We gotta get back to the room, he said. Coleman started for him, but the captain put up a hand. This is gonna sound crazy, he said slowly, but I need you to stay here. His partner gaped at him. For what, he demanded. I don't have a weapon. Terrell looked around behind the counter, reaching under and feeling around beneath the till. Jackpot, he said, and pulled out a sawed-off shotgun, tossing it to him. Coleman checked it and made sure it was loaded. It's gonna be point blank or nothing with this, he said. That's what I'm counting on, Terrell replied, and threw him a wink before heading to the back of the office. He slid open the small window on the back wall and slithered through it to the back of the building. He stayed pinned against the outer wall as he headed for his room, counting the windows as he went. When he reached the sixth one, he jimmied open the lock on the window with his knife and then pulled himself through, crawling onto the bathroom sink. He stumbled on the porcelain, but made his fall as gentle as he could, catching himself on the toilet. His feet hit the linoleum with a light thud, and he froze, listening. The only noise was Miles muffled snoring through the door, and a smile curled his lips at the sound. Snoring meant living. He got up off of the ground and peeked through the crack in the bathroom door. He could hear footsteps on the pavement now and sprung to action. He darted across the room towards his gun that was propped up behind the door. But as soon as he reached the bed, gunfire erupted, ripping through the front window. He hit the floor and Miles snorted awake. What the fuck, guys? He barked, still half asleep. Terrell reached up and grabbed him by the shirt, dragging him down onto the floor with him. What the hell is going on? Miles demanded, eyes wide now. Somebody doesn't like us, Terrell bellowed. Miles' mouth opened and closed. Uh, you think? He finally cried. The gunfire subsided before there was a loud banging on the front door. The first hit destroyed the door handle, but the deadbolt held. Terrell immediately dove for it making a play for the guns. Before he could reach it, the door exploded inwards, but he threw his body against it, slamming it shut again. He quickly grabbed the rifles and slid them back to Miles, who scrambled to aim at the door. Their attackers fired through the cheap wood, forcing Terrell to die for cover to the side. They kicked the door in, and Miles squeezed off a couple of three-round bursts, unfortunately only hitting one man in the arm. Somebody else grabbed the man and pulled him aside to safety. Clear, Miles cried, and Terrell slid across the floor, slamming the door shut and flipping the emergency frame lock to hold it closed, at least for the time being. He grabbed the other assault rifle in the corner and took up position at the window. As he peered out, he saw the injured man being carried back across the street by his partner, another man breaking cover from the bushes to help them. How many we dealing with? Miles asked, as he flattened himself against the other side of the window. Terrell shook his head. At least half a dozen, probably more, he replied. Shit, Miles muttered. Where's Coleman? Office, the captain replied. Miles took a deep breath, shaking the last of his grogginess from his body. 
what's the play? Still working that one out, Terrell admitted. But one thing's for sure, we gotta get to the SUV. He looked out the window again, seeing a trio of men come up from the right. He aimed and fired through the shattered glass, sending half a dozen bullets down range. He missed, and they returned fire, shattering more of what was left of the window above him as they darted for cover. That's three more, he said. Miles pursed his lips. You want me to go out the back and try and flank them? He asked. Nah, I want to make them think I'm only focused on the right side, Terrell replied. He glared out the window, seeing lots of movement across the street. He squeezed off a few more shots straight ahead and to the right, acting like he was ignoring the left flank. Several shots from the distance came flying through the window, some of them damaging the SUV outside. You got the keys? Terrell asked. Miles patted his pockets and finally pulled them out. Right here. Okay, when we hear a shotgun go off, get to the truck, the captain instructed. I'll give as much cover fire. He popped up and fired to the right as he spotted more movement. As much cover fire as I can. Don't care where you get, just get us the hell away from here. More shots poured into the building, and he returned fire, but then the gun clicked empty. Damn it, I'm out, Terrell said. Ammo's in the truck. He slid the gun over to Miles, who swapped him his still mostly loaded rifle. Terrell immediately went back on patrol, waiting for someone to move. Just up the sidewalk to the left, Coleman watched from inside the office. Two men came out from cover across the street, sprinting across the road and taking up position by the building. The second one tapped the leader on the shoulder to move up. As they headed away from him, Coleman darted out from the office, running up behind them. His footsteps were loud enough that the one in the back turned around, but all he could do was widen his eyes before Coleman blew his head open like a cantaloupe with an M-80 stuffed inside. The soldier immediately rushed forward as the other enemy turned to fire, and he grabbed the barrel of the gun and forced it away from him as a few shots went wild. Coleman delivered a vicious throat strike, sending the man to the ground. He held the weapon as the gun fell and sprinted for the SUV. Bullets whizzed by him, prompting him to fire wildly as he ran. Let's move, Cap, he screamed. Terrell burst from the motel door, opening fire at the figures in the darkness. Several muzzle flashes emerged, and bullets flew past them. One of them grazed his arm as he ran to the back seat. Motherfucker, he hissed in pain. As Terrell and Coleman laid down suppressing fire, Miles leapt into the driver's seat. The other two dove into the vehicle as the engine sprang to life. We're moving, Miles warned, and flung the SUV in reverse, making a hard turn onto the road. Terrell fired wildly out the back window, hoping it would pin the enemies down. Bullets peppered the vehicle from the side, and Coleman fired over the captain through the side window. Stay low, he barked. Miles dropped the SUV into gear and sped off into the night. After a few moments of wild driving, the firing stopped, and the trio breathed a tentative sigh of relief. What in the holy fuck was that? Coleman demanded. Terrell shook his head as he sat frontways in his seat. I don't know, he replied. Hopefully it was just some locals that didn't like the fact we were in their territory. Well, if it wasn't locals, then who the hell was it? Miles asked. The other two shared a concerned look, the thought dawning on them at the same time that it very well could have been the boss's men. Miles glanced in the rear view at their silence, and then had the same thought. Oh, motherfucker, he spat. We left, what more do they want? Terrell shook his head. Same thing we do, he replied. Revenge, we put a lot of their men down. Add one more to the list, Coleman said bitterly. Shotgun work okay? Terrell asked. Coleman smirked. I was like a goddamn magician, made my assistant's head disappear. Terrell let out a dark laugh, shaking his head. Sorry to break this up, Miles cut in but where are we going? Coleman sighed. Good question. Just head south and west, take back roads and side streets, Terrell instructed. If they're following us, let's make it difficult for them to track us. He glanced at the clock that read 642. Sun will start peeking up soon. Once it does, we'll find a place to lay low. Miles nodded as he took another turn, driving down a vacant, darkened road. 
Terrell leaned back in his seat, touching the light wound on his arm. Hit bad? Coleman asked, brow furrowing. The captain shook his head. Nah, just a graze, he assured him. Still, a little too close for comfort. Chapter Two Miles continued to drive along the backcountry roads as the sun came up. It had been a half an hour since the battle, but the boys were still on high alert. Terrell and Coleman kept watch at every cross street, looking for signs of movement. You got anything? Coleman asked. Terrell shook his head. Haven't seen another vehicle even, whether driving or broken down. We might actually be good then, Coleman replied. Miles turned down another road and spotted a large two-story farmhouse in the distance. What do you say we stop and collect ourselves, he asked. Figure out where we're going. Maybe get lucky with the kitchen, too, Coleman added. Terrell sighed. With the way our day started out, I'll settle for some peace and quiet, he admitted. Miles found the driveway and slowly worked his way up to the house. Within 20 yards of the old building, he skidded to a stop. Looks like we're gonna have to work for it, he muttered, and pointed to the front door. There were eight zombies congregating there, shambling around each other. It's just a handful, nothing too bad, Coleman said. Terrell nodded. Well, let's get it done then. He flipped open his door and hopped out, slinging his rifle over his shoulder before drawing his knife. The other two joined him, following suit, and as they slammed the doors to the SUV, the zombies turned towards the trio, moaning excitedly. The boys moved a little closer. The crowd around the door broke apart, but one stubborn zombie continued to bang on the door fiercely. Finally, it realized its friends were gone and turned around sharply, letting out a loud screech before tearing towards them. Runner, Coleman cried and dropped his knife on the ground in order to reach the rifle on his back. Just as he raised the weapon, the runner reached him, firing off a few shots, but only striking the thing in the gut. They tumbled to the ground, and Coleman struggled to keep its gnashing teeth away from him by holding its throat. Get this fucker off of me, he yelled. Miles rushed over, grabbing the creature by the back of the collar and pulling it up, teeth snapping and clattering. Coleman grabbed his knife from beside him, stabbing upward and hitting the zombie underneath the jaw the long blade piercing its brain. You all right? Miles huffed as the body crumpled to the dirt. Coleman sat up, examining his arms and hands, relieved when he saw no injury. I'm good, he said, and took his friend's offered hand to get to his feet. Terrell, meanwhile, walked towards the seven slower creatures, all moving towards him in a tight pack. He pulled out his handgun, stopping about 10 yards from the group, and opening fire. He shot five deliberate bullets, dropping several of the ghouls with perfect headshots to thin the herd. With the danger reduced, he stepped forward and stabbed the remaining two in the face, eliminating the threat. You good, Coleman? He asked, as he cleaned his blade and sheathed it. Heart rate is a little fast, Coleman admitted. But other than that, I'm good. Terrell nodded. Good, because we need to clear the house, he replied. If there is a runner, then there's a good chance there are survivors in there. Let's just hope they're friendly, Miles replied. Terrell readied his rifle. Just in case they aren't, he explained, and then led the trio to the door. They moved like they were ready for combat, staying in formation and on high alert. When they reached the door, Terrell nodded to them to make sure they were ready, and then Coleman turned the knob. It was locked, and he shook his head. Go. Terrell said quietly. He took a step back and then delivered a forceful front kick to the old wooden door. It shattered the frame, the door flying back and slamming against the wall. The captain rushed inside, gun aiming down the long hallway beside the stairs. Miles followed him, covering the front room to the left, and Coleman in the rear, taking the right. When nothing jumped out at them, Terrell motioned for Miles to work his way up the stairs. The other two did a quick sweep of the downstairs, finding it empty. Everything was covered in dust, with only the occasional ray of morning sunlight illuminating the area. Miles slowly moved up the stairs, 
heading to a landing that stretched back towards the front of the house. He looked back at the dimly lit hallway behind him, a room on either side of the hall. He moved cautiously towards the first room, opening the door and springing inside. As he swept the empty bedroom, footsteps clacked behind him. He turned just in time to see a short, heavyset man in his 30s with balding black hair coming out of the bedroom across the hall, clothes stained in blood. Miles aimed at him, and the man immediately dropped the knife he was holding and raised his arms, fat tears flowing down his cheeks. Please don't shoot, he sputtered. Please, don't shoot. Miles slowly lowered his weapon, realizing he'd initially reacted as if the man was a zombie. I'm not gonna hurt you, bud, he said gently. You're safe now. The man sobbed, wiping a blob of snot away from his nose. He startled as Coleman and Terrell reached the top landing with their guns raised. We're good up here, Miles called, and at the sight of the man, both soldiers lowered their weapons. Anybody else up here? Terrell asked. The man shook his head violently. No, it's just me, he was able to say, before bursting into a fresh set of sobs, shoulder shaking uncontrollably. The trio gave him a moment to grieve, assuming the runner was his friend. Coleman, secure the door, Terrell instructed. Miles, bring our new friend here downstairs while I try and find us something from the kitchen. He and Coleman headed off, and Miles slowly approached the devastated man. Come on, he said gently, reaching out to take his arm. Let's get you downstairs. You're okay now. The man gave a wet sniffle and nodded, letting his savior lead him down the hallway towards the stairs. Chapter Three The man sat on the couch by the window, averting his eyes from the carnage out front, probably not wanting to see his dead friend. Coleman finished securing the door by dragging a nearby hutch in front of it, and Terrell entered holding a tray of glasses, a gallon of water, and some crackers. Slim pickings in there, he announced, but at least we ain't going hungry. He set down the tray on the coffee table, and then handed out glasses and food, pouring himself some water before handing off the jug. So, what's your name? he asked. The guy stared off into space, still in a daze, so Terrell snapped his fingers in front of his face, snapping him back to the moment. What's your name, man? the captain asked. The man blinked at him. Uh, Chucky, he replied hoarsely. My name is Chucky. He wiped another glob of snot on his sleeve. Chucky, all right, Terrell said, keeping his tone relaxed. My name is Terrell, and this is Miles and Coleman. Chucky swallowed, motioning around the room. Are, are you guys from the military? We were before all of this started, the captain replied. Chucky sniffled again, and then picked at his frayed pants. So, you're good guys, right? Terrell and Coleman shared a glance at his naivety, and then the captain shrugged. That's right, buddy, we are. Chucky looked so relieved in that moment, and leaned forward to fill himself a glass of water before downing half of it in a single gulp. He tried to pass the jug to Miles, who motioned for him to refill his glass first, which he did. So, the man continued as he caught his breath from his deep draft. Are you guys headed to Florence, too? The trio exchanged a confused glance. What's Florence? Coleman asked. Chucky furrowed his brow. Florence, South Carolina, he said. When they didn't reply still, he continued. The survivor camp that's there. Where did you hear about that? Terrell prompted. Brian and I, Chucky trailed off, his voice cracking. He took a deep breath, closed his eyes for a moment, and then continued, his voice trembling. We'd been riding this thing out, just the two of us. This small little town just up the road called Emerson. It started out good because it was so isolated, but it didn't take long for the food to run out. We didn't know what we were gonna do until we heard the broadcast from Florence. Miles leaned forward. Broadcast? Did somebody hijack a radio station or something? He asked. Not quite, Chucky replied, shaking his head. 
Brian's dad had a ham radio, and we'd pass the time talking with other survivors around the country. Hearing their stories made us thankful for our situation. Yesterday, however, we heard a recording saying that there were a lot of survivors in Florence, and that anybody who could hear the message was free to join them. Miles raised an eyebrow. And you believed them? Chucky blinked at him, looking dumbfounded. Why wouldn't we? He asked. People are scared and they're banding together. Why wouldn't we want to be part of that? Terrell gave Miles a warning look, and the latter leaned back in his seat, taking a long sip of water. Did they say anything else? The captain asked. No, it was a short message, Chucky replied, shaking his head. Just saying that it was a safe place for survivors. We went for it, and they got him. Fresh tears rolled down his cheeks, and Terrell reached out to pat his shoulder. It's okay, man, the captain said softly. Brian would have been happy to know you're safe with us. Chucky sniffled, but smiled a little, nodding. After he settled in a bit, the trio of soldiers congregated at the front window. So, what do you guys think? Terrell asked quietly. Coleman took a deep breath. If I were a betting man, I'd say it's a trap. Yeah, but what if it isn't? Miles asked. Wow, what a compelling counter argument, Coleman said icily, rolling his eyes. Were you in debate club or something? Miles raised his palms in surrender. All I'm saying is, it's a calculated risk. Miles is right, Terrell put in. We have no idea where we're going, and if this place has friendly survivors, it could be worth checking out. Coleman crossed his arms. And what if it has people who want to kill us? He asked. It'll be just like any other day in the apocalypse, Miles replied with a shrug. Coleman contemplated for a moment, but then nodded, realizing his friend was right. And if they are friendlies, Terrell added, we need to warn them about the boss. Coleman's brow furrowed. You think he would come this far south? He wondered. I think that asshole has ambitions, so I wouldn't want to take the chance, Terrell said. The sniper let out a sigh and then scratched the back of his head. So, does anybody actually know where Florence is? Terrell and Miles shrugged and shook their heads. It's about 80 miles away, Chucky piped up from the couch, turning his watery eyes to them. You just go up that highway until you hit Lumberton. That's where the interstate is, and it's a straight shot south. Can't be more than 80 miles or so. Coleman nodded. You got the gas to get us there, he asked. Barely, Miles replied, tilting his hand back and forth. We're probably going to want to fill up just in case there's trouble. Last thing you want to do while being chased is run out of gas. Coleman grinned. Looks like we got a plan. Terrell patted Miles on the shoulder and held out his hand for the keys to the SUV. If you guys want to salvage whatever you can from the kitchen, I'm going to go clean out the back seat for our new friend here, he said, inclining his head to Chucky. Clean out? Miles asked, furrowing his brow. I didn't think we had anything back there. The captain shrugged. Well, we did just get in a firefight, he pointed out. There's a fair amount of broken glass back there. Right, his friend replied. We'll be right out then. Terrell headed out of the room and out the front door, the sun shining brightly on him. He took a moment on the porch to enjoy the rays on his dark skin before strolling up to the SUV. Just before he reached it, a shot rang out in the distance, the bullet narrowly missing him and embedding into one of the pillars on the porch. He dove behind the SUV for cover as gunfire peppered the vehicle. Miles and Coleman rushed back from the kitchen, taking cover on either side of the window. They looked out just in time to see Terrell diving behind the SUV and readying his assault rifle. They scanned the horizon, looking for the source of the shots. You see anything? Coleman asked. Miles shook his head. Got nothing, he replied. Get upstairs, I'll cover Cap from down here, Coleman instructed. Miles nodded. On it. He got up and grabbed a quivering Chucky from the couch, dragging him over to the corner where there were two large antique wooden hutches. Miles picked up a potted plant wedged between them 
and tossed it aside before shoving Chucky in the gap. You stay here until we tell you otherwise, got it? He asked firmly. The shaking man nodded furiously. Good, Miles replied, and then broke away to the doorway to the hallway. As soon as he emerged, he saw movement in the corner of his eye and turned to see two armed men moving through the kitchen. They turned towards the hallway just as he spotted them, and he knew he wouldn't be able to duck away in time. Contact, Miles cried, and lifted his assault rifle, popping off several shots from the hip, forcing the two men to duck back into the kitchen for cover. He moved to the stairs, getting around the banister as his enemies fired at him, wood splinters flying everywhere. He laid in wait, listening for footsteps to come up the hallway. After a few tense moments, there were a few boot heels on linoleum, and once they hit the wood of the hall floor, he flipped his assault rifle to three-round burst, stuck it over the side of the banister blindly, and squeezed off a few batches. Panic fire came back towards him, as well as screams of pain, forcing him to retreat around the stairs. When the gunfire stopped, he peeked over with his gun at the ready, seeing that he'd hit one of the men in the knee, and his buddy was attempting to drag him back to the kitchen. Miles fired again, hitting the standing man in the shoulder, forcing him to let go and run back to the kitchen. He lined up another shot, but before he could fire, the banister just below his head exploded, sending wood dust up into his face. He fell back onto the stairs, momentarily stunned from the blast. The wounded attacker on the floor started yelling, Get to cover, he screamed. Go, go! As Miles pulled himself back up, the bullets continued to shred the side of the stairs. Get some, motherfucker, get some! The wounded man shrieked. I got all you can ha- His tirade was cut short when Coleman leaned out the doorway from the living room and fired several shots into the man's chest, dropping him. Miles, you good? Coleman asked. His companion hopped up, shaking wood splinters from his body. Yeah, I'm here. You have any friends? Coleman asked. One went back to the kitchen, Miles replied. Got him in the shoulder, at least I think I did. Coleman nodded. I'll take care of him, you cover Cap, he said. As they broke, gunfire outside erupted, and Miles rushed up the stairs, legs pumping hard. Coleman jumped out into the hallway, gun trained on the back kitchen, hugging the wall to make himself a smaller target. He carefully stepped over the dead man, keeping his focus sharp. As he approached the kitchen, a gun began to poke around the corner. Coleman immediately fired, hitting the wall. The structure was old, so the bullets pierced right through it, striking the gunman, causing his weapon to clatter to the floor. Coleman rushed forward, ready for the killing blow, but the man was ready for him, slamming the soldier into the wall. He tried to aim his rifle, but the quarters were too close. I'm gonna fuck you up for what you did to my friend. The gunman snarled, despite the blood pouring from his shoulder. Coleman head-butted him, landing a direct shot on the bridge of his nose. His opponent staggered back just enough for the soldier to be able to deliver a vicious throat punch, causing him to fully let go. He aimed his gun, but the gunman deflected it with a well-placed jab, sending the bullet into the fridge. The man reached for him, but Coleman smacked his hand away, glancing at the kitchen island. He lunged forward, sending both of them across the kitchen, and slammed the man into the island. Coleman reached down and grabbed a heavy cast iron pan, swinging it up into his opponent's face. It caught the gunman flush on the cheek, the bones in his jaw snapping like twigs. He staggered, and Coleman stepped back, immediately swinging an uppercut with the cooking utensil. His attacker slumped to the ground in a heap, barely conscious on the linoleum. Rather than waste a bullet, Coleman brought the pan down hard on the man's head, splattering blood and skull all over the place. The soldier breathed a heavy sigh of relief before another torrent of gunfire from outside snapped him back into the moment. He quickly rushed over to the back door, slamming it shut and locking it, just as bullets ripped through the windows. He hit the ground hard, barely avoiding damage as glass rained down over him. Coleman kicked against the cupboards, slithering back into the hallway for cover. Meanwhile, Miles reached the landing upstairs and sprinted down the hallway to the room at the front of the house. He burst inside and took up a firing position at the window, 
lined up almost perfectly with the SUV. He saw Terrell crouch down behind the wheel well as bullets peppered the vehicle. He took a moment to survey the battlefield, seeing several muzzle flashes coming from the tree line to his left, and three men moving in formation coming from the right, headed for the captain. Miles smashed a pane of glass with the butt of his rifle before aiming at the trio and opening fire in three round bursts. The first batch landed short of them, causing them to flinch. He took better aim and fired, hitting the leader in the chest, knocking him to the ground. The man writhed in pain on the ground, and his two friends aimed up and fired back, forcing Miles to take cover. Shit, he has a vest, he muttered to himself. As soon as the gunfire stopped, he popped back up, just in time to see Terrell leap up and open fire. The man on the ground was in the process of getting back up, and one of the bullets hit him in the neck. He panicked and grabbed at the wound, blood pouring through his fingers like a waterfall. His two friends turned their aim to the SUV, forcing him back behind cover. Miles popped out of the window and squeezed off several rounds, narrowly missing the attackers. The shots forced them to retreat to the tree line on the right. Terrell looked up and saw Miles in the window, proceeding to give him a thumbs up. The latter gave him a playful salute, and then motioned for the captain to make a run for the house, but he shook his head. Instead, Terrell motioned to Miles that he was going to take the SUV and lead them away, but the soldier firmly shook his head at that. The captain nodded furiously, implying that it was going to happen whether he liked it or not. Finally, Miles gave in, nodding in agreement. The two of them took a breather, both surveying the area to make sure no more attackers were going to come at them. As Miles scanned the tree line, Coleman appeared in the doorway behind him. Is Cap okay? He asked. His companion nodded. Yeah, he's pinned down, but he's alive, he said. How the fuck did they find us? Coleman asked, rubbing his forehead. Miles shrugged. Tracker in the SUV? ESP? He shook his head. Does it really fucking matter? Well, it does if we don't want them to keep finding us, Coleman replied. Guess we'll just have to kill them all then, Miles declared. The sniper cracked a smile, approving of the new strategy. Where do you need me to get Cap back inside, he asked. He's gonna lure some of them off with the SUV, Miles replied. What? Coleman barked. His companion put up a hand in surrender. Got me, man, he said but that's his plan. If anybody follows him, you light him up, Coleman instructed. Miles nodded. We'll do. I'm gonna get back downstairs to cover the back, the sniper said, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. If they try to get in the front, you let me know. Miles checked his mag, pursing his lips at the fact it was mostly empty. I only got five or six shots left with this thing, but I'll make them count. You got your sidearm, right? Coleman asked. Miles nodded, ready to go. The sniper waved and then hustled back down the stairs, gun at the ready. Miles turned back to the window, seeing Terrell waving at him to get his attention. As soon as their eyes met, the captain made his move. He cautiously moved over to the driver's seat, opening the door and sliding in, staying low and quiet. As soon as he started the engine, a few shots rang out from both sides, peppering the vehicle. Miles picked his shots, lining them up with the muzzle flashes from the tree line and firing. He couldn't tell if he'd scored any hits, but the shots on the left side stopped. Terrell hit the gas, speeding in reverse down the driveway, somehow managing to keep the vehicle somewhat straight. When he got to the road, he cut the wheel sharply, sending the SUV onto the highway and speeding off out of sight. A few seconds later, two SUVs tore out from behind the tree line on the right, racing after him. Go get him, Cap, Miles murmured, and then scanned the left tree line, wondering how many were waiting in there for them. Hope there's only a couple of you, he muttered, because that's about all the ammo I got. Chapter Four Terrell sped down the highway, looking in his rearview mirror. Come on, follow me, he urged under his breath. Follow me. His request was swiftly answered as two SUVs pulled out from the driveway to give chase. There we go, he cried and floored it. 
The engine whined in response as it strained to increase speed. Shit, engine must have taken a bullet. As he hit 60, the engine began to rattle, shaking the entire vehicle. Hold on, baby, hold on, he whispered. Terrell glanced in the rear view and saw they were gaining on him, but there was still about a 100 yards between them. He passed a sign that read, Whiteville, two miles. Guess that's where I'm making my stand, he declared, and punched the gas again, trying to build as much distance from his pursuers as he could. When he hit 80, however, there was a loud pop in the engine, and smoke began to billow out from beneath the hood. Damn it, he cried, as the speed started to go down. He could see the front edge of the town in the distance, and squinted when he focused in on a carnival setup. Gonna have to do, he said, shaking his head at the unexpected sight. He gave the gas one more hit, revving the engine and setting it aflame. As soon as fire began to lick out from under the hood, he pulled into the parking lot of the carnival. It was decently sized, with a dozen or so large rides, like a Ferris wheel, small roller coaster, and of course, lots of carnival games. Terrell darted out of the SUV, and it poofed into flames. He quickly reached into the back seat, grabbing an extra mag for his assault rifle, and then rushed off into the heart of the carnival as the SUV became completely engulfed. Terrell dove behind a funnel cake stand, quickly checking to make sure that the area was clear of zombies, which it seemed to be. There was a hatch in the back of the stand, leading further into the carnival, and he made sure it was unlatched. The captain ducked down behind the counter, watching his SUV burn to a crisp, Smoke billowed out, the occasional pop of a round of ammo firing from the heat. It sank his stomach to have had to leave supplies in there, but there'd been no time. Before long, the two pursuing SUVs pulled up. Seven men stepped out, all donned in combat fatigues, bulletproof vests, and holding assault rifles. They walked up to the driver of the lead vehicle, a large, muscular Latino man with a sharply edged face. So you're the ringleader, huh, Terrell thought, and contemplated just taking him out right there. He held off, figuring that if he did that, he'd easily be torn apart by his men. So he watched instead, as the man barked out orders, and then his crew broke off into groups of two. Game on, motherfuckers, the captain muttered to himself, and then snuck out the back hatch of the funnel cake stand into a long alley of carnival games. As he ran up the makeshift corridor, he noticed a dozen or so zombies scattered about on the entire couple hundred yard stretch. As he moved up the row, there was a carnival game ahead, where the goal was to throw a softball into a wicker basket. He reached over and grabbed one of the balls, before ducking around the corner of a building. As Terrell rounded the corner, he was greeted immediately by a carny zombie. The scraggly thing wore overalls, the bottom of its lip missing, where it had been kissed by a ghoul. It hissed with excitement as it shambled forward. The captain didn't bother drawing his knife, simply smashed the thing's face in with the soft ball. The first strike shattered the six remaining teeth in its head, the second putting a sizable dent in its forehead. Terrell leg swept the creature, sending it to the grass where he finished it off. He noticed that the side door to the carnival game was open, so he quietly ducked inside staying out of sight. He dragged the corpse in with him to avoid detection. It wasn't long before he could hear two of his attackers making their way up the alley towards him. As he sat in the dim plywood building, he saw another softball on the floor, laying behind the clown targets. He cracked a quick smile, thinking of the poor unathletic sap who'd thrown this trying to win a girl a cheap stuffed animal. The two gunmen walked in front of the booth, arms locked, aiming their assault rifles with murderous intent, ready to unload at the first sign of trouble. They moved at a slow but deliberate pace, sweeping each booth from the center of the row. Terrell frowned as he formulated a plan. This is a shit idea, bro, he thought to himself. If you survive this, it'll definitely be in the top five worst ideas ever. He watched out the side door for the duo to pass by the alley between the two buildings, as they moved just out of sight, he came out from behind cover. He paused for a second, before launching a softball high in the air, flinging it back over the aisle. 
It crashed onto the roof of the building across and up from him. The noise startled the two fighters, both of whom turned their attention towards the dart-throwing game, balloons on the wall still half full of air, to taunt any potential dart-throwers. Terrell moved up to the end of the building, watching as they cautiously approached the booth that the noise had come from. Moans echoed in the distance, excited for the sound of the softball, possibly signifying a fresh meal. Terrell took out his knife and readied the remaining softball in his dominant hand. As soon as both of their backs were to him, he jumped out from behind the building and rushed towards them. After about six steps, closing a significant portion of the gap, they realized he was behind them. They turned slowly, unsure of the noise that was starting to be drowned out by zombie moans. As the captain sprinted forward, he threw the softball hard, catching the man on the right in the ear, stunning him long enough for Terrell to reach his friend. He managed to catch the man mostly by surprise, jamming the knife into the side of his head. Unluckily, the man turned, so the blade went into his cheek, piercing through his bottom jaw instead. He dropped his gun, gurgling and groaning. His partner recovered from the softball blow and raised his assault rifle, aiming it at Terrell, who grabbed the bleeding man and used him as a shield. The gunner fired a three-round burst, all hitting the bulletproof vest. The high-caliber rounds pierced it, however, lodging inside of the man, who gurgled even more blood. Terrell shoved the human shield forward, and his dead weight pinned his opponent to the platform. As he struggled to free himself, the captain leapt on top, standing on the corpse's back, holding him down. The gunman fired a few shots, but his flailing panic sent the bullets wild. Terrell tried to draw his handgun, but was having a hard time due to the thrashing beneath his feet. He reached down and grabbed a handful of darts from the counter and slammed them into his opponent's face. The man screeched as the tips pierced his forehead and eye. Terrell honed in on the one in his eyeball and slammed his palm down into it, sending it directly into his brain. The man convulsed himself to death, and Terrell hopped off of them, waiting for the movement to stop before grabbing his knife from the top corpse. His breather didn't last long as the five remaining gunmen headed his way. He could hear gunshots coming from the next aisle, and the zombie moans ceased, which meant they'd taken out his reinforcements. Terrell took off running deeper into the carnival as two gunmen came around the bend behind him. They squeezed off a few shots in his direction, forcing him to dive through the opening of a concession stand. He landed hard on the ground as bullets ripped through the cheap plywood and hot dog condiments above him. He scampered to the back door, remaining low as ketchup and mustard glopped everywhere. He burst out the back door into an alley between two rows of buildings and darted out into the next aisle. He turned to run in the opposite direction of his attackers and then skidded to a stop at the sight of a mini horde of zombies. There were 40 or so walking corpses packed in fairly tight, with only a foot or two separating them. Fucking hell, Terrell muttered under his breath and thought frantically as he heard the footsteps of the gunmen approaching fast. He drew his handgun and turned towards them, the zombies about 15 yards from his back. As the first attacker came around the corner, Terrell opened fire, hitting the corner of the building and forcing them back around cover. The captain immediately turned and rushed towards the zombie horde, pumping his legs as hard as he possibly could. He found the biggest gap he could, about two feet wide, and rammed his way straight through. Behind him, the gunman came around the corner, firing wildly, but hitting only rotting flesh. Terrell stayed as low as he could, the moans intensifying at the moving meal, putrid arms reaching out to grab for him. He dodged their gaping maws, his momentum carrying him through most of the throng, knocking down as many as he could to keep his speed going. He finally saw light at the end of the horde, with only a few more rows to get through, but a dead hand caught his right sleeve. He instinctively flew into a spin, sending the handsy creature tumbling to the ground and allowing him to leap over it. He stumbled a bit as he completed the 360, pushing his hand off of the grass for stability. As he approached the last couple of creatures, 
He dove forward to avoid falling on his face, using his hand to spring himself forward. He landed on the ground in a heap, and then rolled as hard as he could, away from the hungry zombies. After a few rotations, he was clear, and quickly got to his feet and sprinted away, the sounds of gunfire still popping off behind him. The captain ran about ten yards, before he reached the entrance to a large haunted house structure. He ducked inside, shutting the door behind him. There was a row of flashlights on the table, and he grabbed one, flicking it on. The black light bulb illuminated the area just enough to make sure there were no zombies waiting to jump out at him. Terrell took a knee, breathing a heavy sigh of relief. Two down, five to go. Chapter Five Miles kept a trained eye on the tree line, still seeing some of the branches move due to the men shuffling around behind it. He stayed back away from the window so they couldn't get an angle on him, hiding in the shadows. With his rifle down to a handful of rounds, he waited for the impending assault that he may or may not have enough bullets to survive. Footsteps rose on the stairs, slow and deliberate, and he stiffened. Had they gotten past Coleman? Was Coleman... He aimed his gun at the door, unsure of who was about to come through it. A moment later, Chucky's head appeared right on the floor as he crawled into the doorway. Holy fuck, man, Miles said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. You about gave me a heart attack. Chucky swallowed hard, shaking his head. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he babbled. What are you doing, Miles asked, turning back to the window. The portly man took a deep breath. Coleman told me to come upstairs and hide, in case things get bad down there, he explained. Miles nodded and pursed his lips, wishing this overgrown man-child would find his backbone and help them in this fight. But a part of him knew that not everybody was cut out for combat. He inclined his head to the closet in the corner of the room. Get in and keep your head down, he instructed. You're probably going to hear. The window lit up with gunfire and he hit the deck. Chucky stared wide-eyed at the display, face white as a sheet. Get in the closet now, Miles bellowed, and his terrified charge scurried across the ground to the closet and closed the door behind him. With that out of the way, Miles popped up from the floor and aimed out the window. Four men ran across the front yard in a staggered two-by-two -two formation. The soldier quickly aimed and fired, catching a man in the back of the pack in the upper thigh. It dropped him to the ground, and he frantically applied pressure to the wound. Miles tried to get another shot off at the next closest man, but returning fire forced him back inside. He turned to scream to the hallway as bullets riddled the window. Three incoming, front of the house, he bellowed. He wasn't sure if Coleman could hear him, but he yelled anyway. As he contemplated his next move, the floor began to splinter, as the attackers began shooting up through the first floor ceiling. Miles scrambled, getting away from the front of the house while firing panic shots through the floor. He stumbled as he made his way out of the room, firing until the rifle clicked empty. He dropped it with a clatter and drew his handgun, aiming it down the hallway and moving slowly towards the stairs. The gunfire from below ceased, and he crept silently towards the stairwell. Meanwhile, Coleman was in the kitchen, watching the front door like a hawk, as he listened to the gunfire coming from above and outside. After Miles' shout, he waited and saw the front door creak open, two gunmen entering carefully. They immediately raised their weapons and fired into the ceiling. Coleman took aim and squeezed off a three-round burst, hitting one of them in the chest, not killing him, but at least knocking him to the ground. Fucking vests, he muttered. Before the other guy could turn and fire, Coleman heard the back door rattle as someone tried to come inside. Without hesitating, the soldier turned and unloaded two three-round bursts into the top of it, shattering the frosted glass and splattering blood on the shards that remained. He kept his attention on the back door, waiting to see if anyone else dared to come through it, but nothing appeared. As he turned back to the hallway, the injured man and one of his friends opened fire, forcing him back into the kitchen. With bullets ripping through the wood, he blindly shot a three-round burst down the hall before darting across to the other side. He dove out the back door, 
sprinting towards the side of the house. Meanwhile, Miles listened to the commotion downstairs as he approached the top floor landing. He stayed out of sight and peeked around the corner, seeing a wounded man on the ground and two others concentrating their fire towards the kitchen. He double-checked his handgun, making sure it was a full clip with one in the chamber before making his move. Then he stepped out onto the landing to get a clear shot at the gunman closest to the stairs. As he stepped onto the wooden landing, one of the boards creaked loudly, alerting the man below. Miles quickly fired several times, catching his opponent in the shoulder. A splinter from the return fire caught him in the wrist, causing him to drop his weapon down the stairs. He leapt backwards, falling on his back, and kicked against the banister to slide himself back away from the carnage. He quickly got to his feet as the firing stopped. He grimaced at the wound on his arm, a six-inch splinter of wood sticking straight out of his wrist. He tore it out with a hiss and tossed it aside, heart rate tripling at the fact that he didn't have a gun anymore. He reached for his knife, but then left it sheathed as his eyes fixated on the large wooden support beam going from the stairs to the roof. This is gonna hurt, he thought, and then bounced from foot to foot, psyching himself up for his plan. Footsteps sounded on the stairs, and he listened hard. It sounded like only one set, and he fell into a crouch, ready to spring. When it sounded like the steps were most of the way to the landing, he jumped from his position, grabbing the support beam and swinging around it like an Olympic gymnast. The gunman fired and narrowly missed the soldier before taking two hard boots in the chest. The force of the impact sent the man flying back down the stairs, cracking the back of his head near the bottom before sliding to the floor in a bloody heap. The wounded man on the ground started yelling, aiming his gun wildly at Miles, who had landed on his side parallel with the stairs. Don't move, the man screamed. Don't you fucking move. Miles slowly raised his hands, grimacing in pain from his daredevil maneuver. Jones, I got the asshole in my sights, the injured man yelled. But Ben's down, though. How's he looking? Jones called back from the kitchen. The gunman kept aiming strictly at Miles, but spared a glance at the brain matter oozing out of Ben's skull on the stairs. He's a goner, he called. Damn, came the only reply. Did you find the other one? Miles' captor called. Looks like he cut and ran, Jones replied. The injured man scoffed and shook his head. Do a sweep and see if you can find him, he instructed loudly. I got this under control. On it, Jones called back, and the back door slammed behind him. Miles' captor sneered up at him. We're gonna interrogate the fuck out of you, and ain't nobody gonna stop us, he declared. All the soldier could do was chuckle at his predicament. His handgun was three steps down. It was a hell of a reach, but it would be his only play if Coleman was out of the picture. He grinned down at his captor. Did you see that gymnastic shit I pulled? Not sure why you're laughing, the injured gunman snapped. Because we're gonna do some fucked up shit to you, boy. Miles continued to eyeball the gun, looking at it, then back to the gunman on the floor. But his eyes lingered a little too long and his captor noticed. I see you looking at that gun there, he said with a sneer. You honestly think you can grab it before I put a bullet in your chest? The soldier tilted his head back and forth, feigning nonchalance. I figure my odds are about 30, 35% I get to it before you put me down. And you're willing to risk your life with those odds? The injured gunman asked. Miles shrugged. Figure I got a better chance doing it this way than letting you boys interrogate me. Well, you're not wrong there, his captor replied with a laugh. So guess this is where we are then. Go ahead and make your move. Miles nodded and prepared to make his life or death move. He stared down the barrel of the injured man's gun, just sitting there waiting, like a duel in the Old West. A few tense moments passed before gunfire erupted outside. His captor briefly broke concentration, the noise catching him off guard, and Miles took his opportunity, sliding down the stairs against the wall. The gunman panicked and fired, narrowly missing his target as Miles grabbed the gun. He immediately raised it and fired several times as he slid down the stairs, bumping his bones on the wood all the way. 
The first two shots caught the gunman in the vest, stunning him. And as he recovered, Miles leapt up from the fifth step directly onto his opponent. He landed hard on the injured man, pushing his weapon to the side and firing a bullet into his temple at point-blank range. As the body fell limp, Miles struggled to catch his breath and regain his composure. He stiffened as a figure came onto the porch and raised his handgun as he gasped for breath. It's Coleman, it's Coleman, the sniper cried, putting up his hands. Miles dropped the gun and then flopped down onto the dead man beneath him, closing his eyes and breathing as deeply as he could. Coleman entered and his eyes widened at the carnage. Jesus Christ, dude, you okay? He asked. Yeah, Miles wheezed. Just wind knocked out of me. The sniper approached him and held out a hand, helping him to his feet. You really did a number on these guys, didn't you? He asked in awe. Just sad there wasn't a video camera rolling for my swinging double kick of doom, Miles replied, and towed the head of the man he'd kicked. Coleman shook his head and chuckled. Well, if that's the result, he said, then I hope I'm never on the receiving end. Let's get their weapons and find Cap, Miles suggested, as he finally stopped wheezing. I know he probably doesn't need our help, but he might welcome it anyway. Coleman cocked his head. We got something we need to handle first, he said. Miles furrowed his brow in confusion and followed Coleman outside and around the house. He blinked at the last remaining gunman, chained to a tree stump in the yard. Is he alive? He asked. Coleman nodded. Unless he had a cyanide capsule and a fake tooth, I think he's just knocked out. Well, if you want to start waking him up, I'll get the weapons, Miles suggested. The sniper knelt down next to his prisoner. Look for some keys, too, he said. Hopefully these boys drove. Good call, Miles agreed. And then they exchanged a fist bump before he headed off. Coleman stared at the slumped man before him. All right, fucker, let's get you up. Chapter six. Terrell shone his blacklight flashlight around, finding only one entrance to the main part of the haunted house attraction. Let's see if things have cooled off any, he muttered, and cracked open the exterior door, looking back to the horde he'd broken through. Several of them shambled towards the haunted house, the rest heading back towards Terrell's pursuers. It wasn't long before more gunfire erupted in the distance, and he spotted zombies dropping amidst the throng. That ought to keep them busy for a while, he thought bitterly. More gunshots rang out closer to him, and he startled. He saw a few of the zombies heading towards him drop, and ducked back into the haunted house quickly, shutting the door enough so there was only a tiny sliver for him to look through. Two men approached the horde, shooting from only a few yards away from the front edge of the group of 20 ghouls or so. They put down a handful of them, and he counted down before springing into action. Terrell took his assault rifle, flung open the door, and opened fire on the duo. He hit one man in the back of the vest with two rapid-fire shots, dropping him with the force of the bullets to the ground. His buddy turned and fired, forcing the captain to duck back inside, bullets riddling the door and sending it flying open. Terrell got up to fire, just in time to see zombies overwhelm the downed man. Screams echoed through the air as the creatures converged on him, biting into his flesh. Terrell moved to resume the firefight, and the downed man's head exploded before bullets tore through the front of the haunted house again. The captain dove back inside, grabbing his flashlight as he went. He came around the first corner into a cemetery scene, about 15 feet wide, with fake tombstones and some ghosts. Well, at least it's not zombies, he muttered and looked around. There was a large foam tombstone that was about as tall as he was, and he placed the flashlight in the center of the room to shine directly on the entrance before taking cover behind the large gray piece. He waited, readying his knife, listening to the gunshots coming from outside. The lighting was too dim to risk firing in there, so he hoped this plan in a long string of ridiculous plans would work. He didn't have to wait long, and a man came through the door. He held an assault rifle, with his own black light flashlight in the other, pressed up against the barrel of the gun. 
Terrell watched the dim beam move around the room, ducking down as it shone in his direction. Slowly, the light panned around, and when he was facing away from him, the captain rushed forward, taking the foam tombstone with him. The noise alerted the gunman, who turned to fire, but Terrell used the large prop to block the gunman from properly aiming, hitting his arms as he turned. He ran straight through the man, tackling him. They tumbled to the ground, and the captain was able to get on top and rain blows down on his face. The ground and pound maneuver was effective, even though the lighting from the two downed flashlights was minimal. While he couldn't see the damage, he could feel the warm blood on his hands, hear the sick crunching of bones with each blow. As the man gurgled blood, Terrell delivered his kill shot, a knife jammed through the throat. He twisted the blade, making sure to finish the job, and then grabbed the flashlight from the floor beside him. He used it to illuminate the body enough and loot a full magazine and another knife. He grinned deviously in the darkness and then dragged the body over to one of the nearby tombstones. He propped the guy up against it and then jammed his knife through one of his eyes to hold him there facing the entrance. As he worked, the gunfire from outside began to die down, signifying his time running out. This ought to let him know I mean business, Terrell said brightly, and then stuck the flashlight in the man's hand, shining it up at his face. He recovered the other flashlight and headed through the haunted house to the exit. Four down, he said, tone gleeful. Three to go. Chapter seven. Miles headed back over to Coleman, who stood over their captive. The sniper eyed him, noting his empty hands. You not find any guns? He asked, motioning to him. Found several, actually, and a decent amount of ammo, Miles replied, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Also found their SUV parked behind the tree line up there, so I went ahead and got it loaded up. Coleman grinned. So we're looking good, then. Oh, yeah, those boys had some good stuff, Miles replied. We'll be kicking ass for a while. The sniper raised a victorious fist. Nothing like looting the dead, he declared. So how's this one doing, Miles asked, motioning to the man beneath them, his head lolling back and forth. Coleman kicked his prisoner's leg. He's still a bit out of it, he said. Miles knelt down next to him, inspecting his face that was covered in crimson from a bleeding nose. Nah, I think he's faking it, he declared, and got back to his feet. What makes you say that? Coleman asked. Miles shrugged. Got intuition? That's sound medical reasoning there, the sniper replied, chuckling. Miles crossed his arms sheepishly. Twenty bucks says he's faking, he suggested. Twenty bucks, huh? Coleman replied, raising an eyebrow. Why not a million, since it holds about the same amount of worth these days? Miles barked a laugh. Good point, he said. Okay, how about this? Next batch of booze we find, winner gets the first two picks. Playing for something real, I dig it, Coleman said, snapping his fingers. You're on. His companion grinned. All right, you want to kick us off then? Coleman knelt beside the man, winding a fist in his hair to lift his head. His eyes stayed unfocused, looking off into the distance. You with me there, bud? The sniper asked. We got some questions for you. The man continued to stare into nothingness. Hello, Earth to douchebag, Coleman asked, snapping his fingers a few times. Anybody home? Still nothing, so he shrugged and got back to his feet, letting his prisoner's head fall back down. Looks pretty out of it to me, he said. You want to concede, or do you have a plan in mind? Miles smirked and motioned for his friend to back up. Once he did, he knelt down in front of the man himself, grabbing his hair as well, and lifting his head up just as the sniper had. I promise you're gonna wanna stop pretending real soon, he declared. And then, when there was no response, he pulled his handgun and fired a hair's breadth away from the prisoner's crotch into the dirt. The next shot is going right through your dick, motherfucker, Miles informed him. And after it's off, I'm gonna fucking feed it to you. The man's blank stare immediately disappeared, his eyes widening with fear and clarity. 
Okay, okay, he cried. I'll talk. Miles grinned and got to his feet, throwing his friend a wink. You're a sick motherfucker, you know that? Coleman asked, though he looked impressed. His companion shrugged. There's a reason I fit in so well with you guys, he said. Coleman chuckled and shook his head, and then turned to the chained man. So, you're ready to talk, huh? Whatever you want to know, man, the prisoner gushed. Just keep him away from me. Okay, the sniper said, rubbing his palms together. First things first, who are you guys? The man swallowed hard. We work for the boss, he said quickly, doing specialized jobs. Like what, Coleman asked. The prisoner shook his head. Yesterday we were leading a horde away from a town, he said. Day before that, we were securing material for a giant bomb. You know, stuff ordinary people might have a problem with. Ordinary people, huh? Coleman cocked his head. You military? The man shook his head. I was police, but some of the other guys were military or ex-military, he explained. Before all this, we all weren't the highest trained people, but today we're better than most. Given how we took all you guys out, you may want to rethink that, the sniper quipped. The prisoner winced. You should see some of the saps we left behind. Fair enough, Coleman replied. But why come after us? We were gone and the boss had what he wanted. His captive shuddered. You'd have to ask the boss, he said, shaking his head. All I know is he said you three were a clear and present danger to the community and needed to be dealt with. So you were just following orders? Coleman asked with a sneer. Novel defense. I wasn't exactly in a position to question orders, the prisoner insisted. And I'm guessing with the skill you boys have, you've been in that same position a time or two. He looked between them with pleading eyes. Or am I missing my mark there? Coleman and Miles shared a pointed glance before the sniper turned back to him. So who is your leader, he asked. Badass guy named Marco, the prisoner replied. Don't know too much about him other than he's an absolute unit of a human being. Big, fast, strong, and ruthless. Not the type of guy you want on your ass. The sniper pursed his lips. So I'm guessing he's not among the dead here. No, his captive replied, shaking his head. He was in the group that went after your friend. Miles clenched his jaw. Don't worry, Coleman assured him. Cap can handle his own. His companion sighed. Still, we should probably go lend a hand. Coleman nodded and pulled out his handgun, holding it at his side. So what do you think we should do with him? He asked. I threatened to shoot his dick off and feed it to him, Miles pointed out. So pretty sure my position is clear. But it's your call. The sniper stared the man in the eye. I understand you were in a difficult position, he said. I've been there myself, and it's not fun. But you have an opportunity right now to free yourself from ever being put in that position again. He pointed a finger in his face. Now I'm gonna loosen these chains so you can get out of them. Gonna take you a little while, but you can do it if you try. You're free to go your own way. But know this, if you join back up with the boss and his men, my friend here is gonna make good on his threat to feed you your manhood. He raised his chin. Is that clear? The prisoner nodded furiously. Yes, thank you, he gushed. You'll never see me again. Ah, but we might, Coleman replied, wagging his finger. Which is why you're gonna find your own path, right? I'm done with them, the man insisted. Coleman studied him for a moment, unsure of whether to believe him or not. Okay he finally said, and then loosened the chains a bit, giving him some wiggle room. You good with that? Yeah, I can manage, the prisoner replied. The sniper nodded. Good. He turned to Miles, and they started to walk away, but he paused and turned back. Your gun is over there by the side of the house. There's some food and water in the kitchen. I would recommend heading inland, maybe down towards rural Georgia. We've heard some horror stories about the coast. Appreciate it, the prisoner replied, I sincere. Good luck, you two. You'll need it against Marco. As the soldiers headed for the SUV, Miles raised an eyebrow. Kind of surprised you let him live, he admitted. Coleman shook his head. Been far too much killing the last few days, he replied. 
Just wanted to remind myself of what it was like to not put a man down. Chapter 8 Terrell took cover behind the wall of the bumper cars, catching his breath from the cat and mouse games. Avoiding zombies and trained killers was exhausting. He looked out over the center of the carnival, noting a large, disturbing clown statue in the center, with several dozen zombies milling about. Sounds of gunfire echoed in the distance. Guess they're running into some of your friends, he thought, as if speaking to the zombies. Would probably be too much to ask for your buddies to take them out for me, huh? The gunshots grew closer, sounding like they were coming from the aisle next to where Terrell was hiding. He ducked down and crept forward, peeking up over the top. A few zombies from the clown cluster wandered off towards the noise. A few seconds later, they dropped, the gunfire closer. This enraged the dozens still in the center, and they moved after their fallen brethren. As they did, Three men appeared, including the beastly Latino guy from earlier. To shoot or not to shoot, Terrell thought. That is the question. He readied his assault rifle, but stayed low, waiting to see what his pursuers were going to do. The leader barked out some orders, pointing in two different directions. A moment later, they broke off, with him and one man running to one side of the horde, and a lone man heading Terrell's way. He was tall and muscular looking almost like a white version of the captain in terms of build. It's like they want to make this easy on me, he thought gleefully. He smirked and threw his assault rifle back over his shoulder, ducking out of sight. He listened as the gunman walked closer to the bumper cars, straining to focus on the steps over the moans of the hungry undead. The wall Terrell hid behind was about waist high, which wasn't a lot of cover if the person was right up on them. He kept his hand on his sidearm just in case the enemy didn't approach him straight on. Shooting would be bad, because it would potentially alert the others, not to mention the dozens of creatures nearby. Terrell readied himself as the footsteps sounded nearly a few feet away and took a deep breath. Here goes nothing, he thought, and popped up from behind the wall. The man was surprised and tried to raise his gun in a panic, but Terrell smacked it out of his hands. His opponent grabbed him by the top of his shirt, but the captain reversed the move by thrusting his arm underneath him and flipping him over the wall. The man landed hard on the wood-paneled floor of the bumper car area, sliding a few feet along the ground on his back. He leapt to his feet, brandishing a long knife. I'm gonna cut you up good, boy, he snarled with a sneer. Terrell drew his own knife, grinning back at him. You're more than welcome to try, he quipped. The man rushed Terrell, swinging his knife at torso height, and the captain leapt back to dodge it. He countered with a slash of his own, catching his opponent in the arm. The man looked at the blood running down his tricep and lifted it, licking the crimson liquid from his skin with a wild expression in his eyes. He lunged forward and stabbed straight out, and Terrell smacked his weapon hand away, lunging himself, but received the same treatment in return. They exchanged slashes and stabs in an almost mirror image dance, but neither could land a hit on the other. Finally, the man raised the knife above his head and brought it down hard, and Terrell saw his opening, ducking to the side and lunging in to stab at his opponent's kidney. In his momentum, he lost grip of his knife, leaving it in the man's gut. His opponent turned around, pulled the knife from his body, and tossed it over the wall into the sea of zombies drawn by the noise. A few of the corpses managed to tumble over the waist-high barrier, smacking down hard on the wood. This just got interesting, the man declared. Terrell shook his head. You and I have very different definitions of that word, he said. His attacker simply grunted in response and rushed forward to attack his now unarmed opponent, despite the blood gushing down his body. Terrell ducked underneath the first horizontal strike and then leaned back to avoid the return slash. The man stabbed at him, but he smacked his knife hand to the side and delivered an open palm strike to the man's chest, staggering him backwards. As his opponent readied his next attack, one of the zombies approached Terrell. The captain grabbed it by the shirt and flung it around, 
using it as a shield to block the knife strike coming for him. The blade embedded into the corpse's skull, and Terrell shoved the creature forward, forcing his opponent to shove it away. The captain took the opportunity to punch him in the jaw, and the man staggered back, his knife still in the fallen ghoul. He frantically swung, missing Terrell, but hitting another zombie in the jaw. The captain lunged forward, putting his shoulder into the man's wounded gut, sending him flying back over one of the dead bumper cars. His opponent hit the ground hard, the air whooshing out of his lungs. Terrell kicked out at the zombie nearest to him, sending it down as well, and then stomped on its head, crushing its skull and ending it for good. His living opponent wheezed as he peeled himself from the floor, blood pouring out of his mouth. He tried to let out an aggressive grunt, but it was weak due to his fall. Terrell looked past him at the zombies on the other side of the wall, reaching out, only a few yards away from a fresh, fleshy meal. He broke out into a spring, rushing straight for his opponent. This caught him off guard, and he threw himself forward in an attempt to meet with equal force, but failed. The captain hit him like a linebacker, but then lifted him up off of the ground. The man's heels dragged along the wood as Terrell drove him back. The man brought his elbow down onto Terrell's head, but he didn't let up, giving one final heave and sending the beast of a man into the outstretched, rotting arms. It didn't take long for the feast to begin, the man screaming in agony as several ghouls ripped at his flesh. Terrell watched as blood spurted everywhere, coating the faces of zombies gnawing hungrily at him. The man's screams were quickly silenced as a creature latched onto his voice box and they dragged him over the wall and overwhelmed him, fighting for the warm meat. The captain walked over and grabbed the knife from the fallen zombie's skull, standing and watching the feast as he contemplated his next move. Two more on the other side of the lot, he thought. What to do, what to do? Straight assault, catch them by surprise and gun them down? He cocked his head as he cleaned the knife and sheathed it. Possible, but where's the fun in that? Then again, a little gunplay might bring in some reinforcements. He glanced at the zombies, some of whom had full limbs in their mouths as they ate. He smiled at them. What do you say, y'all still hungry? He asked, and received loud moans in return. All right, buddies, let's get you some food. He took off his assault rifle before running to the side of the rink and hopping over the wall. He immediately ran towards the center of the lot, past the mini horde that began to follow him, and past the terrifying clown statue. On his left were carnival games. In the middle were concession stands, and on the right were two large buildings, a mirror maze and a funhouse. Terrell looked out, scanning the area to try to get a read on the final two men. He glanced over his shoulder to note that the zombies were a good 30 yards away, so he had some time to figure out his next move. After a few moments, he spotted one of them walking out from behind a carnival game, headed towards the concession. Gotcha, he thought, and broke from the statue, running straight down the concession stand row, using it as cover. When he got in, he moved slowly to the left, attempting to come up from behind the enemy duo. When he came around the corner, he inched his way up to the first gap between the buildings where he'd seen his target walking. He peeked around, only seeing one man about 15 yards up. He waited until he was crossing the next aisle, in full view of the zombies. Terrell came around the corner, gun raised and target in sight. But before he could pull the trigger, another gunshot rang out. The bullet hit just behind his head, startling him and forcing him to drop to one knee. Terrell immediately turned to his left, looking up the aisle, seeing a man trying to get his sights dialed in. The captain fired a couple of times, missing but forcing the man to dive for cover behind a snow cone stand. He got up and ran as his target fired several times. Terrell was able to dive over the front of a basketball shooting game, landing hard on the ground as bullets shredded the booth. He waited for the shooting to die down before popping up and squeezing off several rounds. His opponent ducked for cover at a funnel cake booth, his friend joining him. The three exchanged sporadic gunfire for a few moments, 
neither hitting anything of substance. Terrell ducked down and looked out at the square, seeing the horde of zombies closing in, about 30 yards away from where he was. He looked to the back, seeing only a tall chain-link fence and no door. No door, really? He groaned under his breath, and then waited for the other two to pause their firing before popping up. He shot several times as he leapt over the front of the game, hitting the ground and running up the aisle. His opponents braved the fire and squeezed off a few shots of their own, forcing Terrell to dart down the next aisle. As he came around the corner, he met a zombie directly in front of him. He jammed the barrel of the gun into the bottom of its jaw and fired, sending brains splattering upwards like a fireworks display. He quickly turned and regained his targets, but saw only one. Bitch is trying to flank me, he thought, and then quickly backed up to the rear of the game, taking a knee in the corner and aiming his gun down the aisle towards the clown square. He waited patiently for the man to come around the corner. Within moments, the gunman appeared, noticing Terrell with just enough time to realize he was fucked. The captain fired a three-round burst, the bullets ripping through the man's knees. He fell to the ground, screaming in pain, trying in vain to lift his gun up to fire. Before Terrell could deliver the killing bullet, a few zombies emerged from the square behind him, about 15 yards away. Deciding to save his ammo, he trusted his reinforcements and ducked back around the corner to face off with the leader. As he walked up the next aisle, he heard screams and a single shot from the man with the busted knees. Everybody down, one to go, he thought gleefully, and then leapt out into the aisle facing the concession stands. His target had moved, so he did a quick sweep, not seeing anything other than the zombies coming up the way. He opted to run across the aisle, relieved when nobody fired at him. As he took cover, he saw the door to the funhouse was swinging open, something it hadn't been doing a minute ago. Taking a page out of my book, he muttered. I can respect that. Terrell ran across the next aisle, gun trained on the entrance. As he got close, he popped off several rounds into the door. This was partially to guarantee his cover, and partially to alert the zombies that this was the direction they needed to come. When he reached the door, he slung the rifle over his shoulder and drew his handgun. He quickly ran inside in a crouched position, gunfire erupting as soon as he crossed the threshold. His speed and tightness of his body kept him from getting hit. Terrell returned fire to the side, towards the cash register, while diving behind a display. The room was small, about 10 feet wide, dimly lit with the exception of the light coming in from the door. You brought all these men, and now it's just the two of us, the captain taunted. The man barked a bitter laugh. It would appear as though I underestimated you, Terrell, he called back. So you know my name, huh? The captain asked. Guess that makes you one of the boss's bitches. For the record, I would have personalized that insult if I knew who the fuck you were. Another laugh. You can call me Marco. Terrell rolled his eyes. Oh, with a name like that, you're definitely a bitch. I'm no one's bitch, as you put it, Marco snapped. I'm an independent contractor, paid very well for what I do. It was the captain's turn to laugh. Here's hoping the boss didn't pay up front, because I just saved him a ton of money. I found it best to provide a flat rate to my customers, Marco replied. So all you've done is increase my share. Terrell clucked his tongue. Bold to assume you're getting out of this, he said, and then quickly popped around the corner to fire a few times, missing and ducking back to avoid return fire. If that's the way you shoot, then I feel quite safe, Marco taunted. As they jabbered back and forth, a zombie reached the door. Marco immediately shot it in the head, dropping it to the floor. Terrell snickered. Hope you got more ammo, he said, because he ain't alone. He moved around the display, finding the sweet spot so that he was out of sight of both Marco and the zombies coming in the door. His opponent fired again, hitting another ghoul that entered, but stopped when several more came inside. The creatures were drawn towards Marco due to the gunfire, leaving Terrell unnoticed. He peeked out from cover, 
seeing his enemy dart over to the door beside the register, leading to the funhouse. Terrell got up, ran to the wall by the door, and waited for a zombie to get close. When it did, he grabbed it and threw it inside, ducking down and following it in. The next room had a frosted skylight, illuminating it a little. There were several wooden clowns and characters around the room. Marco opened fire, hitting the zombie several times in the chest. Terrell shoved it forward as he leapt to the side, and his opponent was forced to use a shot to take out the ghoul as the captain came around the corner. Terrell slammed his shoulder into Marco's gut, driving him to the ground. His gun clattered to the floor, and he delivered two quick elbow strikes to the top of the captain's head, forcing him off. They got to their feet, huffing, readying for hand-to-hand combat. Not gonna draw your gun? Marco asked with a sneer. Terrell shrugged. Only if I need to, he replied airily, but I doubt I will. They stepped forward at the same time, exchanging punches and blocks quickly. Marco tried an uppercut, but Terrell deftly backed away from it. He countered with a straight punch to the head, but his opponent knocked it upwards before connecting with his gut. The wind went right out of Terrell, and Marco managed to hit him in the face, bloodying him with the opening. He punched again, and the force of the blow and his body weight sent them both tumbling to the ground, Marco on top. He grabbed his knife and brought it down to Terrell's chest, but the captain was able to grab his wrist, and the two of them struggled, the blade dancing an inch above his heart. As they grappled, moans and footsteps echoed from the door. Three zombies staggered towards them. Marco gave one last heave to try to kill Terrell, but the captain was too strong. Finally, as the zombies were within a few feet, he tried to break away to deal with them, but Terrell grabbed his wrist like a vice. Marco quickly went from confident to panicked and delivered a deft kidney punch, which caused Terrell to let go. Once free, he leapt up and gave a straight kick to the lead zombie, sending it flying back into the others. As he stabbed the next one, Terrell kicked the back of his knees, sending him tumbling to the ground, just a foot away from the fallen zombies. He scrambled for his knife and took one in the eye socket as it lunged for him, shoving it back into its friend. Once pinned, he stabbed it in the head and turned back to Terrell. They looked at each other, and then at the door they'd come through, easily a dozen zombies pushing their way in, with more behind them. Terrell sprinted for the door leading out of the funhouse, and Marco darted after him. As the captain approached the door, Marco reached out, grabbing him by the collar. Terrell responded by turning and throwing a punch, catching him on the side of the head, but not powerful enough to get him to let go. Marco tried to hit him back, but Terrell blocked him and unleashed a few strikes to his head before grabbing his hair and pulling his face down into his knee. The impact shattered Marco's nose, and Terrell kicked him back to the ground. The captain ran to the door, throwing it open as sunlight bathed the dingy room. He looked back, seeing his opponent struggle to his feet as a few dozen zombies filled the room. Better luck next time, motherfucker, Terrell declared, and slammed the door shut just as Marco began to scream. There was a metal loop on the outside of the door where a padlock would fit, so he flipped it shut, taking his knife and jamming it into the hole to lock it up. As he walked down the small metal staircase, the door erupted in pounding, muffled screaming from inside. Gunfire echoed, one shot after another ringing out as Terrell walked away. Finally, it fell silent, and he grinned at the sky. Guess you should have been a little more selective about your shots, Marco, he said, and then headed down the aisle towards the front of the carnival. He ducked behind some booths to stay out of sight of the milling zombies, taking several minutes to get back to the entrance with his injuries and having to be careful. As he approached the SUVs, another one sped up in the distance. Terrell removed his assault rifle and readied it. Fuck hand to hand, he said to himself. Everybody else today is getting a fucking bullet. As the vehicle approached, the horn honked frantically. The passenger window rolled down, and Miles popped his head out, putting the captain at ease. 
Coleman pulled up just short of him, and the soldiers hopped out. Holy hell, Cap, what happened to you? The sniper blurted. Terrell smiled through the blood on his face. I mean, it was seven on one, he drawled. I think I look pretty damn good, considering. They shared a shrill laugh, relieved at having survived the skirmish. We found out it was the boss who sent these guys after us, Miles said finally. Terrell nodded. Yeah, I figured that out when Marco knew my name. We heard about Marco, Coleman said. Was he as badass as he was cracked up to be? Well, he did do this, Terrell replied, pointing to his busted face. So I'll give him props. At least I would if he were still breathing. Miles clapped him on the shoulder, and they let out a collective sigh of relief that the immediate threat was over. So where to now, he asked. Guess we could take Chucky to Florence, Coleman replied. Terrell glanced into the back seat. Speaking of Chucky, he said slowly, where the hell is he? Both Miles and Coleman looked at each other with wide eyes and then laughed. Uh, we may have left him cowering in an upstairs bedroom closet, Coleman admitted, scratching the back of his head. Terrell barked a laugh, shaking his head. Well, let's go get him before he shits himself in terror, he quipped. Not sure I want to spend 80 miles sitting next to that. Trust me, we'd strap him to the hood before that happens, Coleman replied, clapping him on the shoulder as they headed for the vehicle. As Coleman fired up the SUV, Terrell rolled down the window to get some air. He blinked when he thought he heard a gunshot in the distance, but then shook his head, echoes of the dead. You all right, Cap? Coleman asked. Terrell shook his head. Yeah, it's nothing. Let's roll. Chapter nine. With Chucky in tow, Coleman drove the SUV along the interstate towards Florence. Miles hung his head out of the window like a happy puppy, while the portly man stayed silent, staring at his hands in his lap. Terrell stared out his own window, eyes hard. What's on your mind, Cap? Coleman asked, glancing at him in the rearview mirror. He took a deep breath. Just processing the last few days, he said, and trying to convince myself that we're not walking into another shit show. It is the apocalypse, after all, the sniper replied. So a shit show should be expected. Terrell shook his head. Nah, it doesn't have to be, he insisted. Hell, I'm half tempted to have you drop me off on the side of the road so I can find my own way. Not gonna happen, Coleman replied. We've been through too much together on too many battlefields. We're sticking together. Miles nodded, pulling his head back in the window. I'm with you too, he declared. I left the comfort of a quaint little town because I thought it was the right thing to do. You were working for a murderous asshole, Coleman pointed out. Miles shrugged. True, he agreed, but the town was nice. I'll tell you what, Coleman said. We'll take Chucky to Florence, check it out, and whatever you want to do, we'll do. He glanced in the rear view at Terrell. The captain smiled. Appreciate that, man, he said. Same to you, Miles. I just want to try to do some good, you know? We will, Coleman said firmly. We will. He inclined his head at the exit sign for Florence, boasting only a mile ahead. Get yourselves ready, because we're here. Terrell and Miles readied their weapons, and Chucky wrung his hands. What are you guys doing? He squeaked. These are friendly people. We hope that they are, Terrell said, but just in case they aren't. The portly man swallowed hard, grimacing, but nodded in understanding. Coleman reached the exit, and there were two large American flags flying from the top of it. The exit went up to an overpass, two trucks standing guard at the top. Look sharp, Coleman instructed. He pulled up to the checkpoint, where four armed men stood guard with assault rifles. One motioned for them to stop, and another approached the window. Coleman rolled it down. Afternoon, boys, he greeted. Hey there. I'm guessing you heard our little broadcast, the guard asked. The sniper inclined his head to the back seat. Our friend Chucky here did, said we should check the town out. 
Well, we're damn glad to have you, the guard replied. Frankly, we're kind of excited to see that there are so many survivors. Coleman took a deep breath. It's been an adventure getting this far, let me tell you. I have no doubt, the guard replied, nodding. If you want to swap some stories, we get together at Lulu's every night. I'll even get the first round if you come by. The sniper chuckled. I'll never say no to a free drink. Very few do, the guard agreed. And those who would probably haven't lasted this long in the apocalypse, Coleman quipped, and they shared a laugh. So if you want to hang a left here, you'll hit our welcome center in just about half a mile, the guard said, motioning as he spoke. Just park wherever you can find a space, and I'll radio ahead for one of our guides to give you a tour. Coleman extended his hand, and they shook. Appreciate it, he said sincerely, and we'll see you later for that drink. Looking forward to it, the guard replied with a smile. The sniper pulled away, rolling up the window and hanging a left, driving slowly across the bridge. Up ahead there was a tree-lined road, leading to a town fortified with metal sheeting. A couple dozen cars parked alongside the road, and the front gate of the town was wide open. He parked about a hundred yards away from it and turned to Terrell. So what do you think, he asked. The captain took a deep breath. I think if they wanted us dead, they had the firepower to get it done at the checkpoint, he mused. Agreed, Coleman said. Still, Miles put in. I'd rather not give up my gun. Oh, hell no, Terrell agreed. They can pry it from my cold, dead fingers. The quartet got out of the SUV, rifles slung over their backs, as they walked towards the entrance. When they reached 50 yards from the entrance, a thin, older blonde lady appeared in the doorway and walked towards them. You must be my new friends, she gushed brightly. I'm Angie, welcome to Florence. Terrell took the lead, shaking her offered hand. Hey there, Angie, he greeted. I'm Terrell. This is Coleman, Miles, and Chucky. Well, come on in, y'all, she said with a huge smile. Let me show you around. She led the group through the doors, the boys noticing several heavily armed guards with assault rifles. Angie noticed Coleman and Terrell exchanging a pointed look and waved her hand. Oh, don't pay them no mind, she said breezily. They're as harmless as a ladybug, so long as people behave. They haven't allowed a hostile thing to get within a 100 yards of our little town in over two weeks now, so you can feel real safe here. Good to know, Terrell replied. She led them into town, where it looked like an old school block party. There were tents set up with baked goods, games for kids, as well as for a few adults. Everyone seemed pretty laid back outside of the guards. So how big is this place, Coleman asked. Angie spread her arms. We've been able to carve out about 10 square blocks of prime real estate, she declared proudly, which has been plenty for us. However, you're the fifth group to join up since we put out that broadcast the other day, so we may need some help expanding in the near future if you're up to it. The sniper chuckled. Trust me, we're very much up to it. Looking at you, I have no doubts in my mind, Angie said with a wink. Terrell suddenly felt a knot growing in his stomach as he looked around, seeing all of the innocent lives. He flashed back to Clinton, suddenly seeing a lot of similarities, and his blood ran cold, remembering how that ended up. Angie, please don't take this as me being rude, but we really need to talk to whoever is in charge, he said. She blinked at him, curling her hair behind her ear. Oh, there's plenty of time for that, she said. You look like you've had a rough day. Why don't you get some food and some- Please, Terrell cut in firmly. It's important that we speak to whoever is in charge, now. She pursed her lips, but nodded. Okay, I'll take you to Edgar right away. As they started to walk, Terrell turned to Chucky, putting a hand on his arm to stop him. I'm afraid this is where you get off, buddy, he said gently. I don't think you're cut out for what we do. The portly man looked relieved and nodded furiously. He extended his hand to shake. You'll get no argument from me, he agreed. I can't thank you three enough for getting me here. Without your help, I would have for sure died at the farmhouse. Just doing our part, 
Terrell said as they shook. Coleman and Miles waved at him as he wandered off towards one of the food stands. Angie's brow furrowed. Your friend not coming? Nah, he's better off here, Terrell replied, shaking his head. She nodded and then let out a sharp whistle. A young man in khakis and a polo shirt by one of the baking stands perked up, looking over at her. Can you get Chucky some food and show him around, she called. And he shot her a thumbs up before heading for the portly man. She clapped her hands and turned back to the soldiers. Okay, off to Edgar we go. Chapter 10 Angie opened the door to a small insurance office on Main Street. It looked like it was built in the 40s and had never been updated, with original brick and everything. This doesn't look like the office of a town leader, Coleman mused. The blonde tilted her head back and forth. Edgar is a bit old-fashioned and humble, she explained. He believes a community leader should be among the people instead of above them, which is why his office is here. The sniper nodded, impressed. All right, I'll buy that, he said. Angie led the three of them to the back office, knocking on the wood and glass door. After a moment, a male voice from inside called, come on in. She opened the door and ushered the soldiers inside. Edgar looked up from behind an oak desk. He looked about 25, with black shaggy hair and a vintage Judas Priest t-shirt. He grinned wide showing straight white teeth. Hey, Angie, you bring by some new friends? He asked. She motioned to the trio. Well, I was given Terrell, Coleman, and Miles the tour, and they just couldn't wait to meet you, she said. The soldiers exchanged surprised looks at their jovial exchange. Is that a fact? Edgar asked brightly and waved them in. Well, come on in and have a seat. Tell me what's on your mind. They sat down in the comfortable chairs across from his desk, still confused and unsure of what to say. Believe it or not, I totally understand the look on your faces, Edgar said, folding his hands in front of him on the desk. If I were in your shoes, I would be doing the exact same thing. Before everything took a turn for the worse, I was the mayor of this town. The soldiers chuckled, raising their eyebrows in disbelief. The man leaned back, and pointed to a framed newspaper article on the wall that boasted, 24-year-old insurance broker wins mayoral election. Well, I'll be damned, Terrell muttered. Yeah, it was kind of crazy, Edgar admitted, running his hands through his messy hair. My father and I would always talk about ways to better the town, and finally one day he told me to put up or shut up, so I ran against the six-time incumbent. I had no illusions of winning, until it was discovered that he forgot to pay the registration fee, which meant I was suddenly running unopposed. Less than a year later, the apocalypse happens, and everybody is looking to me. He shook his head and laughed. Guess we can file this under, be careful what you wish for. Miles crossed his arms and leaned back in his chair. Gotta love these small town elections, huh? He asked. No kidding, Edgar replied. Well, looks like you're doing a bang up job here, Coleman said. The mayor smiled. Well, I do appreciate that, he said. Now what can I do for you boys? You need to turn off your broadcast, Terrell said simply. Edgar blinked at him. I'm sorry, he said, shaking his head. But it's paid a lot of dividends already. We've rescued 15 people in the last day alone. Families with children who have been writing this out alone now have a home because they heard our call. You need to turn off your broadcast. Terrell said firmly. Edgar stared into those eyes of steel and swallowed hard, worry etched on his face. Can you tell me why, he asked. Because there are bad people who would do bad things to this community if they knew it existed, the captain replied. Edgar raised an eyebrow. I don't know if you saw, but we have guards. So did the last town we came from, Terrell explained. Now they've been overrun by someone who has no problem killing and maiming to get what he wants. The mayor pursed his lips, contemplating for a moment. But what about the good people out there, he asked. Like those families, and you guys. You can set up safe houses far from here, Terrell explained. Check the people out before bringing them here. If you truly want to protect your people, 
You need to realize there are others out there who want to do you harm. Edgar paused and then took a deep breath. Would you be willing to help us set that up? He asked. It's not outside the realm of possibility, the captain replied. The mayor nodded firmly. Good, he replied. Well, I'll go tell my radio operator to cut off that broadcast immediately until we can get it set up. The office door suddenly flung open, a panicked man rushing inside. Well, speak of the devil, Edgar said, and then his brow furrowed at the look on his associate's face. What's going on? The radio operator looked at the trio and then back at the mayor. It's okay, they're friends, Edgar assured him. That, the operator huffed. That trading group from Bluffton that was heading up here is in trouble. They just radioed in that they're under attack. Under attack? Edgar demanded. From who or what? I don't know, the operator replied, shaking his head frantically. I just heard gunshots and they were crying out for help. Terrell got to his feet. Where? Adam's Landing, the operator replied. Where the hell is that? The captain demanded. It's about an hour south of here, straight down the interstate, the operator replied. Terrell nodded. Radio them back and tell them help is on the way, he said. I can send my people if you want me to, Edgar said, holding up a hand. Terrell shook his head. Nah, this is what we do, he replied. Is there anything you need? The mayor asked. Coleman raised his hand as he stood. I could use a sniper rifle, he replied. Really anything with a scope will do. You'll have it, Edgar promised, and picked up a walkie-talkie from his desk. Front gate, come in, he said. The radio crackled back. Front gate. I need a scoped rifle with an ammo kit waiting at the gate ASAP, Edgar instructed. The voice on the other end replied, We'll be ready. After you, gentlemen, Edgar said, motioning for the door. Terrell led the group out, the mayor included, moving with determination. They walked silently through the town, back towards the front gate. As they approached, one of the guards walked over to them with a high-end sniper rifle and ammunition bag. Edgar pointed to Coleman. This gentleman will be taking it, he said. The sniper grabbed the weapon and admired it. This looks like military-grade stuff, he said in awe. What can I say? Edgar replied with a little shrug. We don't skimp on the essentials here. Terrell extended his hand to the mayor, and they shook. We'll be in touch, he said. Be safe, Edgar said. We'll be waiting. Chapter 11 The SUV tore down the interstate towards Adam's Landing. As they approached the small town on Lake Marion, they saw people huddled together behind two vehicles in the middle of the road. Every now and then, one of them would pop up from behind cover and squeeze off a few shots before ducking back down. Looks like this is the place, Coleman muttered. Terrell nodded. Park behind them. Coleman pulled up and screeched to a stop, and the trio got out. Some of the people turned back and looked at them with relief. The leader, a tall, lanky 20-something with black, greasy hair, stepped forward. You the people from Florence? He asked. Terrell nodded. That's us. Thank fucking Christ, the guy blurted. I was starting to run out of ammo. What the hell's going on, Coleman asked as he checked his rifle. The guy shook his head. It's a long ass story, but the immediate news flashes that there are a bunch of assholes that followed us from Bluffton who want us dead, he explained. They started firing at us about 30 miles back. So when we crossed this bridge, we decided to make a stand. Caught them in a choke point. Coleman mused, nodding in appreciation. Not a bad move. The guy shrugged. Well, I was hoping they'd give up and head back, but they've been persistent as a rash, he said. Pretty sure I caught one of them in the chest, but all that did was piss them off. Terrell looked over the hood of the SUV, seeing three vehicles in the distance. Sunlight glinted off of gun barrels, and he frowned. Anything you can tell me about them? He asked. Fuck, man, I don't know. The greasy guy replied, scratching the back of his head. I've heard rumors that they're mercenaries or some shit. All I know is that they have some badass gear and they know how to use it. The captain turned back to his companions. Mercs, huh? 
Coleman asked, as a few more shots rang out from both sides. Miles pursed his lips. I'd bet ex-military for sure. Think they still have respect for commanding officers? Coleman asked, inclining his head to Terrell. The captain took a deep breath. One way to find out. He turned to the leader. I need your shirt. The fuck you talking about? The guy demanded. Terrell motioned to his white beater. I need something white to fly. You drove all this way to surrender? Came the terse reply. Shit, man, I could have done that. Terrell cocked his head. Just trust me, he said firmly, and the leader shook his head as the others looked on, confused. This man is named Coleman, Terrell declared, pointing at the sniper. Nobody fires another shot until he does. Everybody clear on that? The people nodded, arms relaxing. Good, Terrell replied, and then turned to his companion. If this goes south, Coleman nodded, waving him off. Yeah, yeah, I know. Kill them all, he replied. You're getting predictable, Cap. Terrell cracked a smile, and they exchanged a fist bump. Here goes nothing, he said, as he took the leader's offered shirt. He raised the garment over his head, waving it around furiously from behind the SUV. When no shots came his way, he slowly stood up while still holding it high. He moved out from behind the vehicle, shoulders tense, as he approached the enemy row of SUVs. When he reached about halfway, another lone figure came out from behind cover, heading towards him. They stopped a few yards away from one another, sizing each other up. Don't believe I've seen you before, the gunman said in a deep voice, sun glinting off of his shaved head, topping full combat gear with a tactical vest. Sorry, I was a little late to the party, Terrell replied, finally lowering his flag arm. The man shook his head. No apologies necessary, he said. I'll just assume your invite got lost in the mail. Appreciate the courtesy, the captain replied dryly. Mind telling me who you are? The man asked, shifting his weight to one hip. Terrell nodded. I'm Captain Terrell Graham, he said. Captain, huh? The guy asked, looking him up and down. By the looks of you, I'm guessing Marines. Terrell raised an eyebrow. Delta, actually. Delta, huh? The guy nodded thoughtfully, eyes widening a bit as if impressed. I don't say this about a lot of people, but you boys are some bona fide badasses. Ran a couple of missions with some of your friends over in the sandbox. At first I was kind of insulted we were only in a support role, but after seeing what you could do, goddamn, it was like having courtside tickets to watch Jordan play. Just magical. Terrell chuckled. Appreciate the compliment, he replied. So you spent some time in the sandbox, huh? Did three tours for Uncle Sam, and another two tours with my current employer, the man explained. I'll let you guess who paid better. The captain sighed. I've seen my bank statements, I don't have to guess, he agreed. Crazy world, huh? The man replied with a chuckle, shaking his head. One day we're fighting insurgents in the desert half a world away. And today we're on opposite sides of a bridge in a zombie apocalypse. Terrell nodded, sharing the dark chuckle. Crazy is one word for it. So, Captain, the man said, spreading his arms. You tell me what I can do for you. Terrell jerked a thumb over his shoulder. These kids you're chasing, he began. Now, I don't know what they did to piss you off, or what your employer told you to do. But I would very much appreciate it if you'd let them come with us, the people who asked me to negotiate on their behalf seem very eager to have them arrive in one piece. The man stroked his chin, contemplating. You're gonna be putting me in a tough spot there, Captain, he finally said. I have no doubt, Terrell replied, putting up his palms, which is why I'll consider it a personal favor. The gunman nodded. I can live with that, he agreed. I have a lot of respect for Delta and what they went through over there so you can take them. Appreciated, Terrell said. However, the man continued, putting up a hand. You should know that there are others who work for my employer, who don't care about anything that took place before this shitstorm started, so it would be in your best interest to steer clear of Hilton Head Island, and the rest of the low country for that matter. If I didn't know better, Terrell replied, pursing his lips. I would think that was a threat. 
The man shook his head. No, sir, not a threat, he insisted. Just a warning. The men under my command share my sentiments. However, I only have a very small command. Terrell nodded his understanding. He extended his hand, and they shook. Good luck to you with your employer, he said. Good luck to you too, Captain, the man replied. And they broke away, heading back to their respective lines. As Terrell reached the line of cars, he tossed the beater back to the shirtless leader. What the hell just happened? The greasy guy asked as he pulled his shirt back on. Terrell crossed his arms. I talked us out of a bad situation. So they're just gonna let us go? The guy demanded, eyes narrowed. Yep, so let's get loaded up, Terrell replied, and the group scrambled to pile into their vehicles. Military? Coleman asked. Terrell nodded. Yep, and lucky for me, he worked support for Delta a few times. So he knew not to fuck with us, huh? The sniper asked, amused. The captain shrugged. Not sure if it was that, or genuine respect, he admitted. Either way, we dodged a bullet. Well, let's get back to town then, Coleman said. I'm getting hungry. You two go ahead, Terrell said, waving at them. I'm gonna ride back with this guy. The greasy-haired leader overheard, and then let out a sharp whistle to the guy getting into his passenger seat. Yo, get in the back, he called. This man's got shotgun. Terrell cracked a smile as he skirted the SUV. Chapter 12. The leader, whose name turned out to be Maddox, drove back to Florence with Terrell in tow and a few guys in the back seat. Man, I don't know what you said to that douchebag, but we can't thank you enough, the driver said. Terrell nodded. So what are you all going to Florence for? Just dropping off some of my, ahem, special smokable blend, Maddox replied, a light blush rising on his cheeks. Cut a deal with the mayor for some weapons and other supplies. Terrell cocked his head. This have something to do with Hilton Head Island? A tense silence fell over the vehicle, and then finally Maddox swallowed hard. What do you know about Hilton Head, he asked. Terrell shook his head. Not much though I was just warned to stay away from it. Well, you're a badass, Maddox said with a dark laugh. So it's not a surprise they'd want to keep you away from their little dictatorship. Terrell furrowed his brow. Dictatorship, he asked. What the hell are you talking about? Before the end, Hilton Head was a rich folks retreat, Maddox explained. A lot of wealthy New Yorkers and other Northerners would come down for the summer and take it over. Just so happened that a lot of them were in town for a winter getaway when things went bad, so they took over the island. The captain blinked in surprise. With a handful of ex-military mercenaries? They have a small army, Maddox replied, shaking his head. A hundred, maybe even hundreds, don't know for sure. Frankly, none of us has really wanted to get close enough to count, at least not recently. Terrell looked him over. Then why are they after you? We... Maddox sighed. We bumped heads a couple of times. Over what? Terrell asked. The driver shook his head, gaze darkening. A couple people in our camp back in Bluffton have family and friends who are enslaved on the island. Terrell's mouth opened and closed, that rage he was so familiar with, boiling just below the surface. Did you say enslaved? He finally asked, voice on edge. Yep, Maddox confirmed, nodding. Hundreds of them, clearing and fortifying the island, even forcing them to do the dangerous jobs like clearing out zombie-infested buildings. How big is your army? Terrell demanded. The driver shook his head. Not very, he admitted. If I'm being honest, the weapons we're trading for are for defense. We're just trying to hold on to what little we got and not be crushed. Some in our camp are understandably gung-ho about getting their people back, but I just don't see it happening. Not unless something major happens. You might just get the help you need, Terrell said thoughtfully. You don't leave this town until you talk to me again, got it? Maddox glanced at him with side eyes and nodded as they approached the exit for Florence. Thank you, he said. Don't thank me yet, Terrell replied. Still got two others to convince. They followed Coleman's SUV off of the interstate and parked at the gate to Florence. Angie greeted them 
and started leading men carrying large bags of marijuana into the town. Terrell watched and motioned for his soldiers to come over. What's up, Cap? We ready to eat? Coleman asked. Terrell shook his head. Gotta run something by you guys first, he said. And when their attention was on him, he took a deep breath. Those people need our help. They're outnumbered and outgunned. So basically Clinton part two, Coleman asked. Terrell sighed. No, it's a lot worse, he explained. Some people in their camp are being held on Hilton Head and used as slaves. They have an army, professional and trained. It very well could be a suicide mission if we go. So if you don't want to go, you don't have to. Wherever you go, Cap, I'm there, Coleman said immediately. Miles grinned. Same here, he said. Let's go all Abraham Lincoln on their asses. The captain cracked a smile and clapped them on the shoulders. Next stop, Hilton Head. End of book 11. Terrell and company will return in Dead America, Low Country, coming soon. Up next, with Spokane in their rearview mirror, Captain Kersey prepares to meet with the president and his team to finalize the Northwest Invasion Plan in Heartland, Part 6.